Thank you. This session is an offering from the Integral Education Portal. Some of you are subscribers to the portal. Some others would have received an invitation probably over social media or WhatsApp or any other means. So I'll just take a minute to share a bit about what Integral Education Portal is. Um, I would request Palak to probably put the website in the chat so you can have a look later on. Integral Education Portal is an attempt in simplicity to be able to communicate the profoundness and the depth that is there in the vision and works of Sri Aurobindo and the mother. Sri Aurobindo amongst many, many things is also a great educationist and a great psychologist. So there is a great wisdom which is in his works for us to learn as we walk on the path of our own lifelong learning inner growth and education for us to learn as adult learners and for us to learn as educators and psychologists. So whether you know you are someone who simply wishes to progress within and grow and is identifies oneself as a lifelong learner or are you an educator you know, be it for whatever age group, or, you know, someone interested in psychology and exploring the psychological domain, it's the portal for you. As a part of the portal, we send newsletters every Monday and every Thursday. Mondays are more, you get like a video, there is more of the knowledge that comes, but really short. We keep it within 150 words. And Thursdays is more, what is the practice of the week? Because unless we convert what we know into everyday little, little, small, small practices, it doesn't really percolate as a living embodied knowledge. So that's the format. And every month we have a theme. So this month, a very, very special month because, well, there is Valentine's Day in February. And also for those of us who are the admirers of Sri Aurobindo and the mother, there is the mother's birthday, who's the founder of Oroville, the place where I come from, a place aspiring to be a city in the making, of 50,000 people from across the world with one single dream to realize human unity. So she had founded this community about 50 plus years ago. So her birthday is in February and also Orwell's birthday, which is tomorrow, 28th of Feb, is also in February. So which is why we felt that, you know, the theme of love fits perfectly for the month of Feb. So as we come towards a conclusion, towards the end of the month of Feb, for those of you who've been watching videos on why love, what is love, how to love, practicing love, this is like a concluding session. But even if you haven't been watching those videos, I've kept it in a way that uh, you don't need that knowledge as a prerequisite. So with that, I begin. Today, I really felt, so I've basically, for today's session, just pulled out quotations from the mother. I haven't even touched them. I haven't even altered them. And uh, yeah, I just felt that they were so complete. They were so total. And everything that one needed to know, 
and one could read them again and again and everything that one needed to know about love I felt was there in those lines. So I've kept it extremely simple today. Just quotations by the mother. So we'll run over that and then we can go into Q&A. Once again, a gentle reminder to switch on the cameras because this is cheating. No, you can see me. I can't see you. <laughs> so let's be a little fair. Yes, Rajan, Surya. Good that we see each other. Yes, so you should be able to see my screen now. Some of you must have received the poster that said cultivating love and some of you must have received a poster that said living love. Both of them very, very appropriate ways of communicating that love is really something, you know, when we walk the path of life nobody teaches about love right we don't have love even as meditation may be a part of the school curricula nobody teaches love in schools and uh, just like you know we put in our energy we put in our time we put in our effort intention in work so must we put it in love. Oftentimes I see people when it comes to territories of love, we expect that, you know, either we would know or, you know, it'll, it'll come to us. <laughs> uh, but really, just a second, there's a message on chat. Okay. Uh, would request, unless it's super urgent, you want to really interrupt and want my attention over chat, not to put anything on chat while we are going through the presentation. Okay, coming back. So love is really something like, you know, the best imagery that I get around love is a flower. And just like, you know, flower takes soil, water, sun, the loving presence of a gardener, love too, takes that work, that cultivation of love. And only then one can begin to live love, to breathe love. In the beginning, love is probably something that you do. But as one kind of goes deeper and deeper into the journey of love, it is something that is like a flower. It is love. It's offering itself equally, whether, you know, someone who's a great admirer of flowers is seeing a flower or whether someone who probably is, you know, just not noticing it or just seeing it on the surface. The flower is still offering itself in all its possibility, in all its bounty, in all its depth, in all its grandeur and simplicity to everyone. And that's exactly being love. It's like when you become love, it's the fragrance that you carry. It isn't about, I love this person, I love that person. It's like the fragrance is there and the ability of that fragrance to be received by those around you depends on their receptivity. That is the difference, but it's not like you make a difference in terms of who is it that you're going to give this fragrance to. Because you're not really doing love anymore. You are being love. You are love. It is the fragrance that is animating very naturally 
out of the pulse and the depth and the way of your being. So that's living love. So let's see what is love and what is love not. Because when you do a simple Google search, one of the first images that you get about love is something like this. So this is a quotation by the mother, which is very obvious. But since if this is what we are getting as the first image on Google, then we can imagine how distorted must be our notions of love. So love is not sexual intercourse. Then she says, love is not vital attraction and interchange. So it's obvious, it's not sexual intercourse, not to say it's sex is bad or immoral, but that's not love. Then love is not vital attraction and interchange. It's not about, I like this, I love this color, I like this person. It's not vital attraction and the interchange that happens as a result of that attraction, not the romance and the romantic letters and praising each other's egos. So love is not, not that. Next she says, love is also not the heart's hunger for affection. So this is the third kind of image that one sees on Google. And this too mother sees this is obviously way more subtler and deeper than the previous two. But this is also not love. The heart's yearning for affection. Heart's yearning to be loved. Once again, nothing wrong with heart's yearning to be loved. It's like little children, no? Of course they need love. Of course they want love. And nothing wrong with that, but love in its truest essence is not even that. The heart's yearning to be loved, heart's yearning, heart's hunger for affection. And here is how the mother defines love. And this definition of love you know, it's very important to approach it with the presence and the understanding that it's not high up there. That, you know, it's, yeah, it's a definition. And yes, love is one, love is supreme. But when it comes to my everyday living in everyday life, I cannot apply it. So it's very important to not just see this definition is high up there, but really is a living definition in here. So she says, love is a mighty vibration coming straight from the one and only the very pure and very strong are capable of receiving and manifesting it. To be pure is to be open only to the Supreme's influence and no other. Now there are a few subtler nuances in this definition towards which I'd like to draw your attention. The very pure and the very strong. So she is laying out a dual necessity, a dual precondition for love to be welcomed in one's life. And these two preconditions are very pure and very strong. A lot of times these two don't go together. The ones who are strong 
find it difficult to be sincere and pure. And the ones who are sincere, pure, honest, are oftentimes not the ones who have power and capacity. So really the precondition of welcoming this force of love in our lives is these two together. Purity and the power. This is like a solid basis for love. A lot of times, you know, people who have a tender, gentler heart consider themselves weak and sensitive. They are not seeing the strength and the power, the unshakable power of love. At a place, Mother says that he who can truly unconditionally love, for him nothing, 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 nothing is impossible. All is achievable for the one who can receive the force of love. And how to receive this force of love is to work on making an adhara, is to work on making an instrument that is pure and that is strong. Only the very pure and the very strong are capable of receiving the vibration that comes straight from the one vibration of love. It's like in the Matri Mandir, the reed that falls on the crystal in the center comes right from the sun right from the truth, right from the supreme, the love that falls. And then she also makes it a point that she's defining what is pure. Because much of us, many of us have our notions of purity associated with morality, with what is the right thing to do and the right thing to be, to wear prim and proper white spiritual clothing, to be polite in our conversations, not to offend anybody, to follow the social norms, to be the good little daughter of one's parents. That's how we associate purity. But true purity is way more than this. It's a true purity. It isn't much to do with subscribing to social norms and mind's ideas of morality, whereas they do play a role until a certain point in one's journey. But to be truly pure is to be open only to the Supreme's influence and to no other. So what are these other kinds of influences that we get influenced by? Well, to begin with, our own ego, its desires, its preferences, its likes, dislikes based on aversions, attractions, and then to the society's likes and dislikes and norms, and then to our consciousness in the environment around us, what we call generally as family pressure, peer pressure, really the consciousness that is floating around us, we give in to that. We allow that influence to guide our lives, to make us take our decisions. And finally, sometimes we do that thinking we are surrendering happily to the universe. But actually what we are doing, we're becoming like a little football in the hands of all the different naughty forces around us. 
and it's like yeah if the circumstance takes me there i go there circumstance takes me there and i'll go there but to be truly open only and only to the supreme's influence and until the time one can concretely feel the truth supreme's influence is nothing but the highest you can perceive tangibly concretely in yourself that is the supreme's influence for you so to be only and only open to that another thing wanted to draw your attention to the supreme in the indian tradition is known as the sat chit ananda no and here she is talking about to be only open to that which is also a certain clue because often times you know we don't see love and knowledge go together but here when we are talking about love it's founded in sat chit ananda it's founded in the fundamental reality of consciousness it is founded in truth it really is when that deeper the truth consciousness the delight of the truth consciousness when that dynamizes that is love This is an extremely beautiful definition of love by Sri Aurobindo in synthesis of yoga. It's I'm not quoting him verbatim, but it's something to this these lines where he says, "Love is really the deeper delight that grows in infinity, for it has the joy." of the two who are one just this you know in love there is always an other and the funny part is or the beautiful part is it's always the love that loves the love so it could be that you know i might be loving this person that person this situation that community or this thing that thing but really is the love loving itself it's like the play of two in the one and how that deeper ananda and joy really you know grows in infinity when it has that sense of two and it's very beautiful because often we see the sense of two as divisiveness as separation but here because these two are inherently one it's no longer a separated two it's a loving two it's like how the joy grows in its sweetness wonder and splendor because it is able to give itself to another and the another is nothing no other but oneself so it has the joy of multiplicity in oneness it has the joy and the play of duality of love it's also a really beautiful beautiful path because love is not just the universal infinite presence of the divine that we often access in meditation but the divine is also that which one approaches through the heart in one's emotion of service in one's emotion of self giving in one's emotion of giving oneself to another so it's not just the oneness but also the emotion of giving oneself to another like in savitri shrobindo says the two who are one are the might and the right of all things so that very beautiful play 
of duality that comes in love. So with that, how do we generally know of love? Generally speaking, these are the three domains in which we associate love. The first is that of a couple partnership, romance and sex. The second is a family situation. Our parents, our children, our relatives, our grandparents, and then friends that we make on the way. These are the three contexts in which we generally know of love. And I felt it was important to talk of this so that that very high definition of love becomes something which is tangible and real in the context in which we encounter and meet love in our everyday lives. So in these contexts, Mother talks about how love has a possibility of being beautiful, but often is tainted. So human love is beautiful and has a possibility of being beautiful. We, you know, with our friends, in a couple, with family, what is tainted? Here is a quotation by her where she says, love between human beings in all its forms, the love of parents for children of children for parents, of brothers and sisters, of friends and lovers, is all tainted with ignorance, selfishness, and all the other defects which are man's ordinary drawbacks. When I first read this, first thought that came to my mind, I was like, yes, maybe all, all relationships are tainted, but probably not that of a mother and a child. <sighs> and yet, you know, as I'm going deeper into the journey, our egos are really, really strong. We do seek to love. There is a beautiful force of love within ourselves. But our egos are really strong and really in ignorance. And by ego, I don't mean anything wrong. Or, you know, like uh, usually we say, he has a lot of ego. Not like that. It's simply when we perceive of ourselves as little, as narrow. When we refuse to see or when we are unable to see that we are born out of the Supreme's vibration and we see ourselves as this narrow little identity confined to this narrow little lifetime, that's the ego. And out of that, all ignorance, all selfishness, all kinds of attachment, possessiveness, all defects take birth. And that is what Taint our relationship with other human beings. Here is another uh, quotation by the mother. What we usually call love is far from the central vibration of true love. And it is as far as hatred. The only difference is love contracts and stifles and hatred strikes out. But both of them is an animation coming from a narrow little sense of self. So then what do we do? Do we cease to love? Is that what we do then? That, you know, if it's all really tainted and if love is about contraction and stifling, or should we learn to love better. And Sri and the mother says, instead of completely ceasing to love, which besides is very difficult, which would simply just dry up the heart and serve no end, one must learn 
how to love better, to love with devotion, with self-giving, self-abnegation, and to struggle not against love itself, but against its distorted forms. Extremely, extremely important quotation. In the videos also, I give an incredible amount of importance to this word self-giving. That, you know, how can we begin? Because true love can only really manifest once the ego is abolished. But then abolishing the ego is a tall task. So what does one do until the time ego is abolished? One can begin to progressively surrender and give oneself. It is in the process of service that one heals, that one touches something of the, something of the spark of love in being able to offer oneself, just like as we spoke in the beginning, a flower offers itself. It's not concerned about, you know, I am blooming in all my beauty. Who will see me? It will blossom. Whether are they, you know, loving gardeners around it, just mesmerized by its beauty and praising and writing poetry? Or is there nobody at all saying any beautiful things about that flower? It's still blossoming in its majesty. Today we went on a little trek, a group of friends, to a fort. And as we climbed up the fort, no, in many of our hearts, there was a desire. What if there was an ice cream after all? The hard work that we put in and we climbed up the mountain. Then a thought crossed my mind that, you know, the sport must be thousands and hundreds of years ago. And it's been standing still in its grandeur, majesty, offering itself in its beauty with all its love. And in all these years, it has not asked for an ice cream for standing in the sun, no? And But we humans, no? Every little thing we do, we are like, where is our little toffee? Where is our little reward? And even if we can't get our little toffee and our little reward, we are like, you know, but at least I should have been credited for it. <laughs> but at least I should have been acknowledged. They should have put my name on it. Uh, no. To just give oneself totally and progressively to give without a concern about what am I going to get. That is such a beautiful process of sadhana where you really see also your ego raw and bare. You may say, no, no, I thought, don't expect gratitude, appreciation. But really, when you're quietly serving and you don't see your name at the end of it, where you don't see any credits at the end of it, and a part of you is like, but maybe, you know, and part of you sulks there, that's really the time to expand one's ego. Okay, not to put anything on the chat while I'm presenting, because if you put it on chat, it's an indication that I must stop and pay attention to you. So just wait, we'll come to the time where we talk. Of course, if there is a question for clarity, put it on chat because I do want to attend to it. But otherwise, no. Another example that comes for self-giving, two examples that come to my mind. One of them is, you know, there was somebody in the early years of foundation of Oroville wanted to give a lot of money to Oroville. And Oroville needed money at that time. It wanted to buy huge acres of land. I mean, still the acres of land need to be bought. And at that time, really, there was a need of money. 
and there was a really well off donor wanting to give money with no demands but one <laughs> and that one demand was i must have my name put at the back side of the chairs where you sit in the park maybe it could be a little name at a little corner with my second name but that's the only thing that i want that somewhere the money that came for these chairs for this beautiful surroundings came because of that and so and so person and mother in her majesty you know was a lot of money and or will needed money at that time but she said absolutely absolutely no that it is or will will be built by the willing servitors of the divine consciousness by people who are willing to give themselves for no other pleasure or reward but that of giving oneself that of purifying one's ego that of simply offering oneself and that joy that is the quality of money that is the quality of worth that is the quality of people that will build or will only then it will become a living breathing embodiment of something of the divine not to obviously say that any of or most of us or many of us who are serving here are pure you know divine creatures without any ego just serving the mother and serving the divine most certainly not <laughs> but there is an aspiration but there is an attempt another example of self giving that comes because that is what self giving really really demands think about it you're a world renowned artist you know not like a, just beginning to be an artist you're a world renowned artist and you look about in the newspaper or in a bulletin at that time this beautiful image of the galaxy which is orwell's master plan and your heart calls you yes i want to contribute towards building a new world and you travel all the way and you come to india you're a world renowned artist you know orwell the city of the future obviously will need beauty and art so you go to the mother and you say that you know i want to offer all my art to all of it this is you know all that i want to do but at that time orwell was a barren land the image of the galaxy was beautiful but it existed only on paper and as a plan on ground it was basically announced by the un that it's a barren land which is uncultivable and that was the land which was bought that was a practical reality and she says no no right no artists are not needed for orville what is needed is planting trees taking care of the land putting cement on the top of brick brick on the top of cement cement on the top of brick day and night building the matra mandir and self giving because art is only a method a means and instrumentation the aim is to build the new creation the aim is to serve the divine so self giving really is ready to put even all that one knows and is good at to the side for the purpose it is breathing and living for on one hand it is able to put all that knowledge that we pride ourselves in to the little side and on the other hand is willing to learn people in orwell who've made one of the most spectacular forests in the world you know some of them had not even planted a little sapling in their entire lives before coming here 
they were literally you know coming from environments where they never even you know, they did not grow up in a forest they had never even seen somebody plant a sapling and you know some of them we meet here they've grown an entire acres of forest so not only one is you know willing to surrender what one knows but also willing to learn what one doesn't know for the love of the aspiration for the love of the ideal that one carries in one's heart and here are some indicators on how to love better so like we said to give and serve and not take and dominate here are a few more lines by the mother where she says not to want to possess to dominate not to want to impose one's will one's whims one's desires not to want to take to receive but to give not to insist on the other's response but we be content with one's own love not to seek one's personal interest and joy and the fulfillment of one's personal desire but to be satisfied with the giving of one's love and affection and not to ask for any response simply to be happy to love nothing more sometimes i have encountered people misinterpret this in two ways one of them is to become a doormat oh i'm loving and i'm serving and you know i can be treaded on upon the by the other person and whatever the other person will say i will do because i am loving and i am empathetic and i am you know very subtle form of ego one doesn't see you no know, because i am giving you know if you feel i am giving certainly it is the ego once true service takes birth the more and more you see your own limitations how you know we may look very beautiful and decent as human beings inside is a box of worms and you see all those worms no and you see that if love happens through me it's a blessing that it can manifest and pass through me it's not because i am so loving it's really a blessing if i am able to really be an instrument of a selfless and a deeper love and you really see in spite of this little box of worms that we carry still the divine grace trusts us trust this instrument to manifest love and what you really get is an absolute amazement wonderment at the fact that the divine still considers to me for me to be an instrument of love so that subtle thing also that you know to become almost like i said a football at the hands of the forces around oneself another thing is i may be loving a friend a stranger a student a teacher a partner a child mine or anybody else's remember always they are all instruments i am really just loving the divine through them to have that clarity and that utmost 
straightforwardness and simplicity that whatever love that I'm receiving, that is coming from the divine. Whatever love that I'm able to give, that is also the divine's giving and that is also channeled towards the divine. The other mistake that people make, one is to become a doormat in the process and forget the fact that I'm loving the divine and not the other person. My intention is never to fulfill the ego of the other person. The other is in love, we form a little bubble around oneself, particularly in romantic love. It's like, yeah, these are love birds. They always hang out together. La, 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 la. Sweet. Till honeymoon, very sweet. <laughs> but why is it that, you know, even partners for that matter, why is it that, you know, why do partners come together? Do they come together just, you know, to rub each other's egos and please each other? Or is there a higher purpose and a possibility to partners coming together of a greater love to manifest. It's like when I was young, my mother used to say one plus one is not two, it is 11. So if you've been blessed with the possibility of a one plus one in your life, if you be like the little love birds in a nest, it's two. But if you have a little space between the one and one, for the divine to manifest through your partnership, then it is 11. And there's a lot of power in that love. So essentially, the second mistake people make is to make a little cocoon around the one one loves. So I am really able to love. I don't shout at my wife. I don't dominate my wife. I don't try to impose my will on her, la, 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 la. But all the time I am busy doing what? Serving her desires, her little fancies, rubbing her little ego. That's nothing but at least, I mean, it's still a more evolved step than to please and rub one's own ego, to rub another person's ego. But it's also a mistake because it's not really opening you to the vibration of love, to simply get that joy of love and self-giving. So these are some stages of love. We talked about these in both our newsletter as well as in one of the videos that I shot, it is also there in the talk on love and relationships that I gave. So in the beginning, you know, the stages of love are pretty much like we are so inert. We are so inert and shielded from that vibration coming from the Supreme. We're so much dense into ignorance that we can only love in response. It's like I must first be sure that the other person loves me only then can I open my heart to him. And just like the background image shows that of a little girl, yeah, just to be in a little cocoon. And if we do feel, ah, this one is loving me. If there is love here, I will open. Otherwise, I go back to being in my cocoon. So I can only love when I'm sure I will get love from this particular source. If I'm not sure this is the door through which I will get love, I go back to being inert and in my narrow little cocoon. Now these numbers, 60%, purely are based on my estimations, no research or survey behind it. There was one survey that we did, but I couldn't really take it on its face value because the audience had really conscious people. So uh, yeah, I took those numbers, but made it more for generic. So 60% of the time, and one need not only see it like 60% of the people in the world, but 60% of the relationships or encounters that we are in is basically mostly transactional. 
and if you really you may you may think you're loving unconditionally but if at any point in time you've gotten any anger in your relationship that is an indication na 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 it's one of the first three it's not there yet so then one is not so inert there is still a little bit more openness that one is not waiting for the touch to come from outside one is willing to spontaneously love but there is an expectation that i want to be loved back in return it's like we propose the other person from for marriage when they are sure ha ha keh dega ya ha keh degi then only you know now i can bend on my knees otherwise to bend on my knees and you know have a little sense of humility very tough only when i'm sure the ring is going to be accepted that i will invest in the ring so i love you but i want to be loved back it's reciprocal i give so you give me back equal equal you know the equation is equal until now so 60% 30% 90% of our times and 90% of our population is gone next is now this is the most tricky one okay i still love you even if you don't love me that is incredibly a very very high spiritual state already it's a very high spiritual state mother says and just to be able to love even if you know i know that i i not loved in return but you must acknowledge you must accept my love it's like you must have noticed yourself i don't know if you've noticed i have noticed in the past i've noticed myself saying this line and i caught myself saying it and it goes something like you know i'm happy to do mom when i'm saying it it's funny because i was saying it out of my ego at that time and i really believed it at that time it's so funny no? uh so i i remember seeing you know i'm happy to give myself i'm happy to do everything and i don't have any expectation that you should do anything you know you shouldn't do anything i'm happy to give there is no expectation but how could you not value it <laughs> you know how could you just like just like oversee all the effort i'm putting into things how could you not acknowledge it and uh, and then i realized this tastes bad when i see it <laughs> the taste is not pure uh, and yeah it's the ego no that yeah i am able to love you but at least you should acknowledge at least you should you know at least see that yes divyanshi is doing so much <sighs> yeah so that need for acknowledgement that need to be seen understood accepted and that is usually more often than not that is what we are calling as unconditional love when we are mostly calling unconditional love this is where we are stuck at it's not unconditional it is really not but mostly our unconditional love is just till the time i can say you don't do what i'm doing for you or you know you don't have to put in even 0% of the life my life i'm giving to you but you must at least acknowledge that's what we usually call as our unconditional love but then there is the very tiny little sparks the 0.1 or rather 0.00001 where it's just the pure joy of loving and one indication of the pure joy of loving is that there is no residue there is zero energetic residue it's like you did something and you offered and there's not even a memory of how ah, i did this or there was no i in the sense of doing it it's just that it flowed and it enriched you in the process in the process your heart became so much wider your mind became so much more silent you became so much sweeter 
charming. Your body became so much lighter. And all of this happens as a byproduct. It's just a flow that happened. It's like it didn't even feel like I gave myself or I had any empathy for anybody. It's just something that, that got done. And you could just happily see and observe and feel a lot of gratitude that I was considered, I was considered capable for to be able to receive and channel that force through me. And all that is left is a lightness. So this, this has an incredible amount of simplicity, purity, and a certain lightness of being when this sort of love touches and flows through you. It doesn't have any energetic residue. And then what happens? So what happens, you know, when in these contexts of our family, our friends, our partnership, when one begins to bring this deeper love, one may say that, you know, it's you're still only loving your family, you're still only loving your partner, you're still only loving your friends. How does purifying love in those circumstances going to help? Actually not. Purifying love in whatever context you are in leads to deepening. And that deepening leads to a universal love. So here is a quotation by the mother where she says, if you do that, you've taken a great stride forward and can, through this attitude, gradually advance farther in the feeling itself. And realize one day that love is not something personal. That love is a universal, divine feeling which manifests through you more or less finely, but which in its essence is something divine. To go a bit, a bit further than this, extremely beautiful quotation by the mother almost in love with this quotation it is the love that loves behind all things it is the love that one loves it is the love that loves itself everywhere form and sound are excuses so you may love that flower this person this thing that they are all excuses for the divine vibration of love to love itself. It is the love that loves behind all things. It is love that one loves. It is love that loves itself everywhere. If there is one thing that you can take from this session today, let this be this quotation. It is the love that loves itself everywhere. It's like for our communication, we may have to say, I love you, because that's a matter of communication. But truly, love only takes birth when there is no I, when there is no you. There is an instrument of the human being through which it flows. And love, the supreme love, finds an opportunity to love the supreme love through another. And then she says the most perfect love, the most loving love is the Lord's love. So what is the Lord's love? The divine love is first of all a way of loving. Divine love, true love, finds its delight and its satisfaction in itself. It has no need to be received and appreciated, nor to be shared. It loves for the sake of loving as a flower blooms. So on one hand, the Lord's love is not just, you know, the divine loving me and I loving the divine. It's your way 
of being and loving in your everyday life. So first of all, divine love is a way of loving. Second, divine love is also the source of love. When one has found the divine love, it is the divine that one loves in all beings. There is no longer any division. Whether am I loving Sahana, Palak, Surya, Srijan, Ram, doesn't matter. I'm loving the divine through them. Or whether you love me, it's the divine that is loving me through you. So it is the ultimate source of love. And it's very important to have that clarity. And thirdly, it's not just the source of love and the way of loving. Love is the purpose of our being. If you're on the search of finding the purpose of your life, perhaps you have a clue here. A universal love, a universal divine love that has plunged into the night for the redemption of the world from the universal inconscience. When I came to Pondicherry, the question which was alive in me was, what is the purpose of life? And then I met with this one lady. She was, she's an ashramite. She was just so totally in love with the divine that looking at the colors of the vegetables brought like a childlike joy and spark in her eyes. That washing utensils in the kitchen was like an act of magic in her everyday life. Then I felt so stupid that, you know, I am asking myself, what is the purpose of life? What is the purpose of life? And in that process, a lot of life had drained out of me, just like oh, seeking answer for what is the purpose of life? Then I saw like a full bloom lotus flower in her blossoming as love. And I realized that, you know, when one is, Busy being love and joy, one doesn't question what is the purpose of life. It's that simple. It's only when that force of love dries and one becomes like a desert that one is like, what is the purpose of life? <laughs> purpose of life is love. That is the reason why we came down upon earth to bring the lotus in the muddy waters on earth. I think this is the last slide. Huh? So with that, 21 slides and going five minutes over time, I closed the session formally because I know it was supposed to end at nine, but for those of you who wish to stay are very welcome to stay. And we can have a little sharing, a little questions. Anything you'd like to share, anything you'd like to ask, anything. You may just simply, um, yeah, just probably unmute yourself, hoping no two people will unmute at the same time. But Or you can also write on chat, whatever feels comfortable. Okay, so there is a first question on chat. Divyanshi, I have a question. Why is the acknowledgement stage of love taken for granted if it is in, in is if it is turned towards a human being? Shrata, would you like to unmute and share so I gather better? I'm not sure if I'm assimilating the question. Yeah, yeah, sure. Actually, my uh, network is not in a good condition, so I will not be able to put on my video. Devanchi, it happens that uh, in the acknowledgement stage, I have seen various people when they love a person, their love is taken for granted by the other people. They think, okay, the person is just loving and uh, doesn't want something in return, so we will take it for granted. And secondly, when this pure love, the joy of loving, it can be found in a flower or it can be found in the smile of a child or in nature. But why is it so difficult to find that joy of loving in our near and dear ones? And uh, how to get over this feeling? Thanks. 
Excellent questions. Thank you, Shraddha, for keenly listening and asking these questions. So, first of all, one can only be taken for granted when one is loving human beings. Which means, if I'm loving the divine through human beings, my focus is on the divine. And I do not, it's not human beings that I'm loving. It's through human beings I am loving the divine. It's never human beings onto itself. Of course, human beings will take love for granted depending on the stage of consciousness they are at, the stage of love that they are at. Say, for instance, if I am myself so inert that I need a person to wake me up to the vibration of love, of course, I will take, you know, love for granted because I'm not even looking at what can I give. I'm looking at what can I get and am I getting love? So I'm filtering my surrounding. I'm filtering people around that, around that lens. So of course, that love would be taken for granted. I would not be surprised. But it's not people taking the love for granted. That's not where the issue really lies. The issue is if you are feeling your love is taken for granted, my dear, you need to reflect and introspect and see, are you really loving the divine through people? Or are you yourself people pleasing, attached to people, seeking appreciation and loving human beings for the sake of loving human beings? The moment you begin to love the divine, that feeling of taken for granted begins to go away because it's no longer really people that you're loving. You're loving the one. It's only through people. And then it doesn't matter whether somebody is taking for granted, doesn't is not taking for granted. And then if somebody is taking for granted, that's not the route through which you pour. You pour through other routes. It's like there are a lot of vessels in the world which are receptive and wanting to absorb the vibration of love but we want to limit it to our friends and families and our husbands and who said you know you want you have to give love at places where it's been taken for granted you give love at places where it's not taken for granted so it's something for you to reflect on why is it you're in a situation where you feel it is taken for granted. The second part, it's easy to, you know, find the joy of loving in the smile of a child or in a plant. Now, in a plant life, life is much simpler. It's much, much simpler. By the time it evolves into animals, it's complex. By the time it evolves into human beings, it's more complex. And from children to adults, the life that evolves become way more complex. So it's not just the fact that, you know, he adult human beings are all egoistic and all of that. There is a complexity that we are dealing with as human adults. And in that complexity, if we've not found the soul, if we've not found something which is animating from the deepest part of who we are, we organize our identity and ourselves around the outer nature. And there is that entire complexity of emotions, of thoughts, of mind, and there is that entire complexity to be tackled. Whereas if this complexity is really tackled, human beings can be the most finest instruments of the divine love. The possibility is there in a human being, but that possibility is veiled and that possibility needs to be awakened. And there's a complex instrumental nature and machinery that human beings have to deal with 
which flowers that way are very simple, pure, straightforward, a vibration that's coming and that's blooming through a color, fragrance and form. It's a very relatively a simpler manifestation. There is human beings, as human beings is very complex, a machinery that we are dealing with. So don't feel dejected that it was better if you were born a flower. <laughs> but there is a possibility and the possibility once love blossoms through a human being, just like it blossoms through the divine mother, no? It's, it magnifies the possibility of love, the way it can blossom through a human being is divine. And it is because of this complexity that we are dealing with of the mind and being, you know, that it, it is difficult. But when it really arrives, it's way, way, way profounder and total and integral than it is in any other form so far that has existed. Shraddha satisfied? <laughs> Okay. Yes, so thank, Sachin, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Seriously. Thank you. Yeah. Sachin has a question. Could you please throw light on how to move from acknowledgement to just joy of loving? First is to acknowledge that is where you are at. And to acknowledge that that is your petty little ego. And to just be aware and just keep watching. Actually, you don't really have to do much. You just really have to watch and see what is happening. And actually, once you really begin to observe within yourself, even the 9.9, .9, you'll see is very rare in occurrence. So already to reach 9.9 .9, it's only 9.9 .9 percent of age of the time that you know you're just able to love and only thing you want is acknowledgement if you'll really see very tiny little little everyday interactions in life something as simple as taking a printout in that simple little attraction with the person who's given you the printouts you will notice inside of yourself what are the expectations that are coming you know in any group of friends you will notice small small little little things a huge part of us is inert so the first step is to observe and purely become aware without getting affected so you may see terrible things inside of you, which you had earlier never seen. But once you really begin to observe with the keenness of observing, like a inner scientist, oh, you know, ha, ah, jealousy is here. Wow, I learned something new today. So if you're really able to observe as a scientist, rather than, oh, I see jealousy. Oh my God, how can I feel jealous? No. Oh, jealousy, wow. I never knew I had jealousy inside of me. Oh, wonderful, this possessiveness. That's so beautiful. So to just simply observe and become aware that at least now I know most of us, 99% of the times, have a have it's like we are on the tip of the iceberg. We're not even aware of you know, the reasons why we take decisions, the reasons why we're getting attracted to people in our lives, the reasons why the machinery of life is working the way it is working. And it's first of all by becoming aware and not getting affected by it, to just simply be open. Okay, now I'm opening a box of worm, not like you're opening, that you don't deliberately have to open the box of worm and invite you know, in conscious stuff to show up inside of you. But just set that intention of self-observation. And you can put like little, little reminders like on your bathroom mirror, look within, on your study table. Did you take a minute to look within? Just small little reminders that make your, you know, gaze. All, often all the time we're looking at things outward. It's like if a problem happens, it's the circumstance of people to be blamed. 
and maximum what we do is oh i am also ready to take some share of the blame but if we forget about you know how are people and circumstances causing this problem but purely see it as a problem in consciousness as a shift that needs to be made in consciousness and to purely just observe a lot begins to get revealed so the first and the absolute necessity is to begin to observe and see the events that are happening within oneself without judgment initially it will be like a part of your mind looking at another part of your mind but that's not the observer within you you really just have to go to that silent vast pure conscious presence it's like really like a vast infinite godhead that's just seeing reality and actually once that part of you sees and becomes aware much of it falls apart it's like you know how in our indian households whether it's fungus or any little thing you know we have on our clothing in food we put it in the sun sun just needs to look at that and it all the viruses fungus just goes away similar on the inside also the moment your inner sun the inner sun looks at all these little little jealousy this that expectation it will begin to lose its power and force so one part one huge part of really evolving is self awareness just to quietly be aware not tend to try to fix it do something just aware that you know i'm just exposing it to the sun within and then to offer that is another first is to be aware and then to accelerate your journey a little forward one of the practices that one can probably do is so you're noticing on an everyday basis towards the end of the day to consciously sit and notice and now you're not noticing your inner dimension and parts of it from what you did during the day you're purely observing from the perspective of small tiny inner little movements inside whether they felt lighter and delightful or they felt contracting and you're not even trying to judge them they're just these two kinds of emotions one that leads to a widening a deepening a heightening and another that leads to you know a narrowness and a contraction and stiffening and rigidity just observe these two movements inside of you and offer it to the sun within so you really accelerate that journey of course you know you had exposed it to the sun by constantly becoming aware and now you also put in that your force and your vibration of aspiration and surrender so you observe these two movements and literally lift them up and offer to the inner sun to the inner godhead to the inner fire if at the moment it's a little difficult for you to relate to words like the inner divine just simply begin with visualizing a flame in the deepest most chamber of the heart and just offer these two movements at the end of the day to that eternal fire in the heart the thing is the fire is the same thing that cooks our food and fire is also that burns and destroys and what we put on our dead bodies once you know we pass away from this world so fire is really that power that has the power to strengthen the movements of heightening widening and deepening and fire is the same force that has the power to destroy 
the movements of contraction, narrowness, possessiveness, attachment, and all the drama that comes with it. So begin to observe and begin to offer. Are there any other questions or sharings? If not, um, handing it over to Palak. Palak, would you like to say something? Or shall we close with a minute of silence? Yeah, I think uh, we can close with a minute of silence. And I'll just quickly put the subscription link again. I just received a couple of messages. So I'll, I'm putting it again for everybody's reference. And yes. Next month's theme is integral health. So that's beginning 1st of March, Monday. If you're not already subscribed, but like I think the link is wrong. It's a uh, uh, ha hashtag subscribe. Yeah, that's the link, yes. So if you have not already subscribed, subscribe to it. We have a very dear Alokta who is going to be our subject expert for March. And the way we've tried to do integral health is a little bit of actual practical lifestyle changes so that, you know, it's really grounded. And at the same time, you know, something that is also at a deeper level, bringing a certain shift and a receptivity within you. So it's done in a beautiful way. I hope you receive the newsletter and you subscribe to it. Pala, could you also put about humility in the chat box? So what we are also starting March onwards and the deadline to apply for it is midnight tonight. So do it today. Midnight tonight or midnight tomorrow? But do it today in any case, even tomorrow. if it's yeah. tomorrow. Mm -hmm. okay. So March 1st onwards, we are also starting a small group of humility. So it will be on WhatsApp, a WhatsApp group. The idea came because we had uh, a group of seekers, you know, who are alumna of our own projects and our courses. They were doing learning journeys focused on mother's qualities. And they were having really a very deep experience. So they would continue to have that. And as a part of these learning journeys, they were sharing a quotation of the day and a practice of the week. And we felt that, you know, why this quote of the day and practice of the week only needs to be shared with 12 people? What happens, you know, when it's shared with 100 more people? So, we're going to be sharing as a part of the humility cycle, which will run through March and April. Uh, you just have to simply join the WhatsApp group. Probably we can also just send a follow-up email. We have your email IDs. We can just probably send an email ID, or if you can, you can put the link on the chat. So I think that's that. With that, we take a minute of silence and then we Thank you. The WhatsApp group link is on the chat. You can join the humility WhatsApp group. Thank you. Thank you for joining. 